you might want to hold the applause <laughs> to hear what I say. Only libertarians get up early on a Sunday morning and listen to a talk about interest rates in a hypothet hypothetical world and then abortion. Um, <laughs> I, I, was, I was going to start by saying something like, you know, unlike anarchy and intellectual property, the abortion issue is kind of difficult, <laughs> but like, wait a minute, only we would think that a oh, war is easy, you know, taxation is horrible, the state is bad, anarchy is obvious, um, the Israel-Gaza issue is easy, Ukraine and Russia, that's easy, but abortion is the, the one thing that we, we, we don't know yet. Um, um, okay, on this issue, everyone has an opinion on abortion, probably, so um, I kind of want to go through some common arguments and some common libertarian arguments um, about this topic. Um, I have sort of changed my mind on this issue over the years, being a, a parent. Um, I've become a little bit less stridently uh, pro-choice. I used to be a Randian and I was like, it's just a clump of cells. That was my original view. Um, but I've become more sympathetic to the pro-life arguments in some ways. Uh, I would say that in my experience, libertarians um, in, um, over the last several decades have typically tended to be uh, pro-choice, right? Um, almost all objectivists have been pro-choice, and most libertarians have been pro-choice, pro although there have been some exceptions. Like there was a woman named Doris Gordon, um, who was a, a, a secular, uh, rand-oriented uh, libertarian, but she was pro-life. She actually started this group called L4L, L4 Liber Libertarians for Life. Um, and my impression is that in recent years, with sort of the rise of kind of a new form of paleo libertarianism and the rise of the Mises Institute type um, libertarians inside the Libertarian Party in the US, um, there's more pro-life pro uh, views than, than, than in the past. In fact, in 2022, um, the Libertarian Party was taken over by the so-called Mises Caucus and they changed the platform to eliminate the pro-choice plank that had been in there for for a long time, which, which upset a lot of people, a lot of the pro-choice types. But the argument was that, listen, it's a contentious issue among libertarians, so th the party shouldn't take a stand on it and let every let every candidate uh, have their have their own view. Um, but you know, there's lots of issues where it's possible to make progress among libertarians. Uh, a lot of libertarians come from conservatism and they become libertarians, or they come from leftism, and they and some go through the phase of being a minarchist, and then they finally become an anarchist, so people can change their minds. I myself changed my own mind on intellectual property about 30 years ago when I investigated the issue, and I became an anarchist as well uh, uh, about 35 years ago, going from minarchy to, 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 uh, to anarchy. And, you know, some of my views have even changed on the, like say, the Ukraine and the Israel issue because of listening to Professor Hoppe's uh, comments uh, has moved me in that direction as well. Uh, but it does seem like on the abortion issue, it's almost impossible to change someone's mind on that issue. Um, the issue seems to be sort of intractable, right? Um, because it's rooted in deep, deep lifestyle preferences or religious beliefs, and it seems to be hard to make progress on this. So what are the, the well-known arguments for, for abortion? Um, the pro-choice argument, of course, is sort of the modern or feminist view is simply the argument, it's my body, the government shouldn't be able to tell me what to do about it. But of course, there's the complication that there is a baby inside, so that, that makes it a little bit harder. Um, Ayn Rand, who was also pro-choice, of course, she had an interesting take, and she said, you know, um, you have to uh, uh, you have to uh, favor the rights of the woman, and she says a piece of protoplasm has no rights and no life in any human sense of the term. But then she says one may argue about the later stages of pregnancy, but the essential issue concerns only the first three months. I don't think so. I think that I think the difficult issue is what to do about the late term, right? Um, so even the, even the Randians seem to admit that it's difficult. It's a difficult question at the later later part of pregnancy. Um, and then the, the pro life view is is more religious. Um, and the problem with the, with the religious argument is not that it's necessarily wrong. It's just that it's based upon religious views and it's not ex exactly rational. And it's hard to know how to appeal to someone with a different faith if they don't agree with you. So. It's hard to make progress uh, with someone who has a religious uh, perspective on it as well. Now, what about libertarian arguments? As I said, most libertarians have tended to be pro-choice, 
Um, but Doris Gordon, who I mentioned earlier, uh, was this neo-Randian, and she had a secular argument against abortion. I, I think her argument was really bad, though. Her argument was simply that um, uh, unborn babies, fetuses, are humans, and therefore they have human rights. So it's almost a semantic argument. And you know, it's kind of the simple, the simplistic argument. It's like, uh, well, if a, if a baby is not a human, what is it? It's not a monkey. But that's not really an argument for, for why you should have rights, is because you're human. Um, because we, most, most people would, would say that if you have any d defense of rights based upon reason or rationality, there's a capacity that humans have that gives them the status of having rights. And it's rooted in our reason and our reasoning ability, which means that if there were another species, like an intelligent animal species or an alien species from outer space, they would also have to have rights. Um, but they wouldn't be human. So it can't be being human that is the source of rights. Uh, it must be some, some of the capacity that humans happen to, ha happen to have, right? Um, now, another interesting argument about abortion is Walter Block's uh, evictionism argument, um, which I believe is extremely convoluted. Um, it, it, he sounds like he's pro-life, but he's really pro-choice because his argument is basically this. Um, um, so Walter almost takes Doris Gordon's argument, which is that unborn human babies have rights. Why? Because they're humans. And if they're humans, they must have human rights. So he concedes that, I guess, a, even a one-day-old embryo would have rights because it's a human. However, um, it's also a trespasser on the, on the mother's body. So the mother, just like you can evict a trespasser in your house, you can evict a, a trespasser inside your body. Of course, he ignores the the inconvenient fact that <laughs> most babies are not actually trespassers. They're actually invited by the actions of the, uh, uh, of the mother and the, and the, and the father, um, uh, except maybe in the case of rape, but in, in most cases, the, the fetus is not, um, it's, it's a natural result of, of sex. Um, and Walter, Walter, Walter's response to that, I, I've made that argument to Walter in the past, and his argument is, well, you can only have a contract with someone that, that exists like when you invite someone into your home, but the baby doesn't exist until after, after copulation. So it's some kind of convoluted argument. Um, so in, in Walter's view, um, the mother can evict the baby. She can, now, just like if you had a trespasser in your, in, your, in your store or in your home, you have to evict it in the, in the gentlest way possible. Unfortunately, under today's technology, that means killing the baby. So <laughs> abortion is justified, according to Walter. Um, interestingly, I, just before I came to Turkey, uh, someone arranged for me to debate Walter Block on voluntary slavery, which we disagree about. Walter believes that uh, you can sell yourself into slavery. Um, um, and I, I agree with, 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 uh, with, I think, Hans and with, with Rothbard that the uh, human rights to your body are inalienable and, and such a contract should not be enforceable. Uh, so we had this debate, and Walter ended up saying something like, um, um, if a couple is trying to have a baby and they can't conceive, and they, they implant their fertilized egg into a surrogate mother, then that, mer then that surrogate mother she could not uh, abort the child because she has a con she's basically sold her body temporarily to the married couple. So according to Walter, the, uh, a normal pregnant mother who has a, a trespassing fetus that she invited by having sex can, can abort the baby, but a surrogate who has sold herself into slavery to the parents can't. I don't know. The, the whole thing is like a little bit convoluted, I think. Um, And, and, you know, and there's lots of other problems with, with this approach. Um, so, for example, if, if technology were to progress and we were able to take a fetus out, say, middle, middle, in the middle of the pregnancy, uh, and it wouldn't kill it, um, um, would the mother have to do it in that way instead of having a regular abortion? Because, like, in a regular abortion, you know, you can have that done with, with a pill, let's say, and um, it's not invasive. But if her option was to actually have a C-section and have the baby taken out that way, what if she says, well, I don't want to have a C-section, would she still be able to kill the baby? So there's lots of issues um, uh, with that. Um, my view has always been that it seems to me pretty obvious that human be adult humans have rights because of our reasoning capacity. 
you know, uh, it's, it's, uh, and this is a part of Professor Hoppe's argument for rights, uh, his discourse ethics too. Um, it has to do with the capacity to, to make claims and to make arguments. Um, and that uh, it seemed, it's always seemed obvious to me, this is my personal view, I'm not trying to argue for this, but this is always my view, is that a, a, a very young term fetus uh, has no rights because it's, it's not developed enough yet. It has the potential to, to have rights in the future, but it doesn't yet. So there's obviously a continuum. There's some point at which the, the young fetus has no rights and then a, an infant does have rights. So somewhere in between is where the line would have to be drawn um, if we're going to uh, call certain acts a uh, 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 feticide uh, uh, type of crime. Um, um, being a parent, I'm, 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 I'm even more sympathetic to the argument that um, an early, an early term um, abortion for no reason is increasingly immoral, but it still shouldn't be illegal. That was always my view, right? So the more I thought about this, and when you realize that these things are really just intractable, um, um, I think the only solution is to, th is to think about it like this. Um, um, and by the way, I want to quote something Professor Hoppe wrote in, in A Theory of Socialism and Capitalism, where he said, the ownership rights stemming from production of goods finds its natural limitation only when, as in the case of children, the thing produced is itself another actor slash producer. According to the natural theory of property, a child once born is just as much the owner of his own body as anyone else. And I agree with that, of course. Um, but you see, there's the implicit assumption there that uh, that birth is a sort of a special moment that that separates when we know for sure humans have rights and when they don't. Um, um, so let me mention one other thing too that I disagree with Walter about, and uh, I've made this point before in some of my some of my uh, my, my my articles. Um, libertarians often say that, um, unlike other competing political philosophies we don't believe in positive rights. We only believe in negative rights. We only believe in negative obligations. That is the obligation not to invade someone else's property, not to harm them, but we have no positive obligations. Um, and so for example, it's commonly said that, look, you might have a moral obligation to try to save someone you see drowning in a lake, but you don't have a legal obligation to do so. Um, and, but, but the problem with that is, what if you push them in the lake? So, if you're the one who's responsible for the peril that someone is in, then I think you do have an obligation. So libertarianism is not against all positive obligations. We're, we're, just, we're only against unchosen positive obligations, right? So we have negative obligations not to harm other people, but we also have obligations to, to help someone if we put them in position of peril. And I think you could make an argument that voluntarily conceiving a baby um, which is in its natural state helpless and dependent upon the mother and the parents for survival, e even after birth, you could argue that that, that voluntary action does uh, give rise to some, uh, some, uh, some positive obligations on the part of the parents. And you could argue that if you believe the baby has rights, that would include the, the obligation not to kill it. Um, <laughs> so that's where I sort of end up on this um, um, as, as, as the right way to look at it. But then the question is, what should the law be? Should abortion be legal, illegal? Uh, should it be legal in the beginning, but not in the late term? Um, and the way I look at this is, it's, uh, it's something I, I realized in going through my correspondence um, 20, 29 years ago, in 1995, I, I found a letter I had written to a friend and I was discussing a conversation I had just had with Professor Hoppe on the phone. And I, I believe Hans, uh, we were discussing argumentation ethics and rights, and I think Hans tried to urge me to write something about abortion. Um, and I, uh, it's 29 years later, but I'm finally getting, getting around to it. Um, um, and Hans's view, which he is, I, I've heard him talk about, I believe Hans's view is similar to, to mine. It's almost a jurisdictional issue, and that's, that's the title of my talk. Um, um, we have to recognize there are certain unique things about abortion, right? Um, um, you have the religious views, which are hard to argue with because people have different positions. There's the, the feminist view. 
but uh, it just means the, the issue is uniquely intractable. You're never going to make progress with anyone. And we also have to recognize, like, let, let's say in, in the U.S., I'm in, I live in Texas, Texas might have a law on abortion, but they don't, they don't have any say-so about California's law, and they don't have a say-so about Turkey's law or China's law, right? So everyone sort of recognizes that unless you want a one-world government, there's a sort of jurisdictional issue to how crimes are defined in a given area. So, for example, if you were pro-life, you might criticize China for allowing abortion until the, until the, until the, end, of the end of pregnancy, but it wouldn't be your business to, to, uh, to, to police that in, in China. Um, and the, you, could, you could make the same argument here. So my approach is, is that um, uh, until the baby is born, we should simply view the family unit, and in particular the mother, as having the jurisdiction over this issue. So in other words, the legal community would, would not be the outside legal community. That wouldn't be relevant, not until the baby's born. When the baby's born, then it's subject to homicide laws and infanticide laws and things like that. But up until that point, it's simply a matter for the family to decide. Now, you could, you could ostracize a family that, that has its own law which says abortion is permitted until the ninth month, but it's their business, it's not, it's not your business. So I think that actually the way to solve the abortion issue is to simply be hands off and let the family unit itself be the one that makes the decision. Um, um, there's, a lot, there's a lot of reasons uh, that I think are in support of this. One is the fact that um, if you consider late-term abortion to be murder, um, if, if that would require really intrusive uh, policing system to just detect it. Because theoretically, a woman could get pregnant, stay home for nine months, and no one would even know. It's, it's, so, it's sort of a private family matter. Um, and, and, and if you consider abortion to be murder, you know, what if the mother smokes, or she drinks too much red wine, or she trips and she's negligent, um, and then the baby's injured because of that, or the baby dies? Would she, be, would she be liable for some kind of negligent homicide in that case? Um, I mean, don't pregnant mothers have enough to worry about already? Um, without having to worry about liability for something that goes wrong during the pregnancy. So for all these reasons, I think the best solution is simply to recognize the family is the best one to decide and, and just for the legal system to stay out of it until the baby's born. Hans actually did. I, I, I found something. In 2011, Professor Hoppe was uh, teaching a course uh, in Romania, um, and he, he, was, he was asked the same question about uh, abortion and the state's role and uh, guardianship rights. And Hans... Hans's view was that abortion should be a family matter, not one for the state to be involved in. Um, and so that is, that's, that's my view too. So I'm just gonna conclude by saying a couple things. I was reared Catholic. I went to Catholic school for, for 12 years. And so, so uh, I was an altar boy and all that. So, uh, so Guido, I apologize for this talk. And uh, <laughs> uh, so now that I've solved the abortion issue, I'm going to try to uh, work on exempting Bitcoin from capital gains tax. Thank you very much.